Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. Uh, are you guys ready? Are you guys fully prepared to discuss what I believe to be the most adorable passages of prose that Tolkien ever wrote in his entire life? I mean, oh my goodness. Like, it's so cute that... Yeah, I'm not sure we're all going to make it. So we'll have to try. We'll have to do our best. Oh my goodness. Okay. Tonight, we're discussing what is called... Uh, the epilogue uh, of The Lord of the Rings, uh, which seems to be how Tolkien himself conceived it, but um, he didn't write it that way. As we, you know, as Christopher says, he, like, Manuscript A, you know, that first manuscript, which was pretty much continuous from many partings all the way through here, all the way through to the very end, right? Continued without break, right? So he just, he went... He got to, well, I'm back, blew straight through it, and continued going on. Um, that's not to say that he never intended to have a break there at all. You know, that he, there wasn't going to be any, you know, he wasn't eventually going to put a demarcation in there. Um, but it's interesting, right? This is not like an afterthought. This did not come later. This is this was just part of the flow, right? Part of the flow when, um, um, as he was writing, uh, and... Uh, I definitely, <laughs> I, I, certainly, I think you guys can understand why I wanted to have a whole class session, why I've added a class to the to the schedule in order to make sure that we can spend some time on this, because this is adorable, and not just adorable, um, but it's also, um, uh, it's also really interesting in that it actually kind of answers a bunch of questions more clearly. Uh, I love the fact that his kids are doing Q&A like that, and he... Uh, you know, he goes he goes through and inserts the answers to questions that didn't make it into the narrative, including the ant wives, right? Um, in the context of Sam answering his kids, knowing what questions that kids would ask. One brief reflection I had, a little bit irrelevant, so I'll just say it at the beginning. Uh, not quite irrelevant, but, um, you know, I was... Um, I've been reading a lot of C.S. Lewis lately. I've just been rereading recently a bunch of C.S. Lewis's works, and... Coming from uh, reading a bunch of Lewis to reading uh, this passage to reading the epilogue here, The Lord of the Rings, I was just sort of uh, reflecting on the fact that this is a, a passage, this is a scene C.S. Lewis would never have attempted to write. You know, I mean, he did, um, uh, he did do the, um, I mean, we get like, I mean, the closest thing we ever get to anything like this is like the passage where, you know, Peter and Susan go to talk to the professor in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But I mean, it's nothing like this. Uh, and like, this is, this is not a world that Lewis knew, right? Uh, but you can really hear and feel the familiarity right here. I mean, this is... This is a guy who has read to children in his study past their bedtime, right? I mean, uh, so much of this was um, just classic uh, in that regard. Like I said, Lewis would never even have attempted this scene uh, because he, you know, he, he doesn't know enough, right? Uh, he's never he's never dealt with children like this. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, so anyway, that was just something I, I couldn't help but uh, uh, but reflect on. Um, yeah, and yeah, it is pretty remarkable that the Q&A goes really deep into the legendarium, and I certainly think, I mean, Sam's answers to the questions, um, you know, although Tolkien took this passage out, and there are some things where you can say, you know, there's, there's evidence that Tolkien's thought changed on this. Uh, some of these answers to the questions, I think, are clearly, you know, this passage might have been taken out, but I think it's clearly authoritative. Anyway, let's um, uh, let us plunge straight into the text. So uh, the hardest part for me, of course, was not choosing passages to discuss. It was choosing passages not to discuss. <laughs> you know, not just to turn this session into one long uh, reading with commentary, uh, which might have been okay, actually. But um, anyhow. 
And one evening in March, added 1436, Master Samwise Gamgee was taking his ease by a fire in his study, and the children were all gathered about him, as was not at all unusual, though it was always supposed to be a special treat. He had been reading aloud, as was his usual, from a big red book on a stand, and on a stool beside him sat Eleanor, and she was a beautiful child, more fair-skinned than most hobbit maids, and more slender, and she was now running up into her teens, and there was Frodo lad on the hearthrug, in spite of his name, as good a copy of Sam as you could wish, and Rose, Mary, and Pippin were sitting in chairs much too big for them. Goldilocks had gone to bed, for in this Frodo's foretelling had made a slight error, and she came after Pippin, and was still only five, and the red book rather too much for her yet. But she was not the last of the line, for Sam and Rose seemed likely to rival old Gerontius Took in the number of their children, as successfully as Bilbo had passed his age. There was little Ham, and there was Daisy in her cradle. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I... <laughs> okay, so... Last night, in Exploring the Lord of the Rings, we spent a lot of time talking about Frodo's chair uh, at the uh, table, at the high table at the feast in Rivendell. Uh, the suitable chair, uh, you may remember, that he has. Um, so, um, anyway, so so I'm, uh, I, 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 I was immediately noticing that they're sitting in unsuitable chairs. Uh, that is... Just a very small notice. I, I don't think I would have noticed this if we hadn't been talking about that so much last night, but uh, definitely was noticing it then, uh, which suggests to me that Sam has a bunch of grown-up chairs in his study. I wonder who sits in them normally, right? I mean, so there's there's the chairs that are there, and the kids have, are sitting in them, and they're not their chairs, right? Um, does he normally have other gatherings? He must do. Right? I wonder who comes and gathers around with Sam in his study, usually. What other grown-up hobbits uh, do that, such that when they're sitting in the grown-up chairs, uh, the, the, the hobbits are... <laughs> okay, Kate thinks maybe they're for dwarves. Because you never know, truly, when dwarves are going are gonna, to are gonna stop in. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, the names... Uh, of course, you know, the names are, 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 are known. Um, but... Uh, Little Ham is kind of adorable, isn't it, Karina? I mean, of course, that's the one named after his dad, Hamfast. The gaffer is, is named Hamfast, but uh, there was Little Ham uh, is, uh, I mean, that's really cute. And yes, Tarloniel, that is a good, um, uh, that's a good observation. The boys are all named after people, right? There's Frodo and Merry and Pippin, and then there's Hamfast, right? So after he's named one of his sons after each one of his companions on their long journey, uh, kind of sad that there isn't any Odo Gamgee, um, he does, in fact, finally name one after his father, uh, Mariotic. Um, yeah, you know, Zach, it, I was wondering that too. Uh, you know, he's mayor. Sam is now, so is is that what's going on here, right? Is there uh, is it like mayoral business that he does he normally conduct mayoral business in his study? He must be used to visitors. There must be a bunch of visitors, right? People who come uh, to talk to Sam, and he sees them in here. Uh, I was that was the best I'd come up with too, Zach. Um, but um, <laughs> exactly, Nancy points out there also seems to be no fatty Gamgee either. Yeah, so true. Um, but, um, anyhow, yeah, so, um, the, um, uh, the, the girls, of course, uh, not named after folks, right? Um, uh, they're named after, well, most of them named after flowers, right? We've got, uh, uh, Eleanor, right? And Rose. Rose is named after somebody, right? Of course. Um, I like how there's Rose and there's Daisy, uh, and there's going to be Primrose uh, later on as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, let's see. Yeah, it is too bad we don't get a fatty Gamgee, Nancy. That is that is really true. Um, what kind of... Yeah. Goldilocks is certainly the name which doesn't fit 
right? <laughs> Lots of people making three bears references. I know, right? Um, and uh, one wonders to what extent that might have uh, um, influenced Tolkien here, right? That is to say, like, the idea that, like, the true story behind Goldilocks and the Three Bears uh, is, like, in Sam's family here, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, of course, it's just descriptive. I mean, it doesn't seem like a strange... It seems to me like a, 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 a name that fits... Perhaps she has blonde hair, right? Um, which we're told is unusual. So, you know, he, uh, he, they, 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 they name her Goldilocks, a sweet little simply descriptive name. Um, uh, it does sound almost like a nickname, Nancy, though I don't think it can be as that's the name that she's given in the, uh, in the letter, right? And it's what the king calls her too. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, James, it is true that Eleanor is the fairest of them all, right? Um, but she's not the only one of Sam's children with uh, blonde hair. And we do get, um, it is true, of course, Nancy, we get lots of blonde children in The Hobbit the year that Eleanor was born, right? Um, but Sam's family contains a bunch of blonde children. And Therefore, the, what seems to be the implication here is that the Elvish um, blessing, right, which was spread throughout the Shire on in the year 1420 with the dust that uh, that Sam spreads around, there was like literally something in the water that year, right, uh, because of the, the Elvish blessing that Sam dispersed through the Shire. But that blessing seems to, ha to have been resting, you know, upon... Uh, upon Sam's family, right, uh, in this um, sort of prolonged way. Um, yeah, but certainly, uh, you know, there's... Uh, uh, <laughs> Arthur was thinking that she, uh, Goldilocks, probably went on an adventure in, uh, uh, in Bjorning country. Nothing could be more likely, I think. Yeah, good. Anyway, um... Yeah. The rivaling the rivalry of Gerontius took of the of the old took in his um, childbearing is uh, before I'd read this something that had literally never occurred to me. I mean, there's all the emphasis, of course, as the passage mentions on Bilbo passing him in age, um, and. Uh, I never thought of Sam passing him in uh, uh, child begetting, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, um, <laughs> boom fly. I, I wasn't thinking of it in terms of radioactive dust causing mutations across the Shire. It's like that, except really quite different from that. Um one of the things that really interested me about the reading of the Red Book, though, it's not mentioned in this specific passage, but the fact that he's taken so long to read it um, and that he only reads it on great occasions, it's not like he reads it to them every night, right? Um, this is a great occasion. Well, it will eventually be changed to be a great occasion because it's Eleanor's birthday. Um, but, um, but yeah, we'll... Uh, uh, we'll we'll kind of get we'll get to that version of it uh, later on, um, but yeah, th that comment about Frodo lad, right? That the one that he names Frodo is the one who looks exactly like him, is kind of adorable, right? Uh, that's uh, real. And uh, see, Tarlani, I forget off the top of my head how many kids Gerontius took had, but if you go to the genealogies at the back, it's uh, a bunch. I for somebody can count for me. Um, I forget, but uh, rare, uh, many children he had, and uh, Sam does have more in the end. Sam and Rosie uh, pass the old, poor old Took, right? All of his marks get passed. Merry and Pippin are bigger than Bandobras, and Bilbo's older than he is, and Sam is more fruitful. It's, um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I know. He's got nine in this chapter, right? And and they're still they're still they're not they're not even slowing down yet. In fact, it seem, the implication seems to be that Rosie is is pregnant already again uh, in this text, even um, because there's going to be another child born really soon. In fact, after this. Um, OK, right. Gerontius has 12 children. Thank you. Um, uh, 12 children. And Sam had at least 13, uh, maybe 14. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very good. OK, let's keep going. Uh, Eleanor is asking if her flower still grows, if the Eleanor flower still grows in Lothlorien. I don't see why it shouldn't, Ellie. I've never been on my travels again, as you know, having all you young folk to mind. Regular ragtag and bobtail, old Saruman would have called it. But Mr. Merry and Mr. Pippin, they've been south more than once, for they sort of belong there too now. And haven't they grown big, said Mary. I wish I could grow big like Mr. Marriottic of Buckland. He's the biggest hobbit that ever was, bigger than Bandobras. Not bigger than Mr. Peregrine of Tuckborough, said Pippin. And he's got hair that's almost golden. Is he Prince Peregrine, away down in the Stone City, Dad? Well, he's never said so, said Sam. But he's highly thought of, that I know. But now, where were we getting to? Nowhere, said Frodo Lad. I want to hear about the spider again. I like the parts best where you come in, Dad. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to handle <laughs> these passages tonight. Um... Yeah, so James says the familiar reference to Saruman feels really jarring uh, to him. It is really interesting uh, that he quotes Saruman there, as old as old Saruman would have called it, right? Um, giving his children an insulting name like Saruman gave, uh, and of course he's quoting, and this is something that Sam himself didn't hear, right? He's quoting from the Red Book itself, right? Um the ragtag. This is the 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 the, the comment that uh, Saruman directs at Merry and Pippin, right to Gandalf. Um, yeah. Um, so interesting there that he's not quoting anything that he actually Sam actually heard Saruman say in any of his interactions with Saruman, which were only on the road in Dunland, and then uh, again, of course, in the Shire at Bag End when he saw him killed, and. Um, he doesn't quote that, right? He doesn't quote anything that he says there. What he's quoting is a story. And for me, James, that's the, the interesting thing, right? He is quoting Saruman, the literary character, right? Whom he did know, but he wasn't there for that scene. And that's that's the part of that that I found most interesting. We, we really see um, one of the things, of course, that we can see happening uh, throughout this uh, whole section, and even more than once in this passage alone, is the relationship between the... St I mean, you think of back... I can't help, of course, but think back to the stairs of Kirith Ungol and the famous conversation between Sam and Frodo about stories and people who end up in stories and things like that, and Sam thinking a lot about that at that time, right? But um, uh, here we see... Um, here we see him quoting Saruman, again, whom he's met, right, and whom many of the hobbits will remember, right? Uh, you know, I mean, like, so, he, but he doesn't allude to Sharky, right? He doesn't connect anything to any of their experience, any anyone present, right? Only Merry and Pippin uh, would have heard Saruman say this, right? Only for them would it be a memory of their own experience. To Sam, Old Saruman that he's quoting is one of those figures out of his old story, right? Except it's the story that he, not that part, but he was a part of that story. Similarly, the business about Prince Peregrine. That's also in the book, right? The business about the Prince of the Halflings, right? The title that was given to Pippin in Minas Tirith. Little Pippin seems to have paid close attention to that part of the Red Book, right? He knows that bit. Um, is he Prince Peregrine away down in the Stone City, Dad? Right? Do they still call him Prince Peregrine? Um, do they still call him the Prince of the Halflings? Um, and I, by the way, I don't even know how many years it was before 
I realized <laughs> that I'm really slow on the uptake sometimes. I don't even know how many years I had been reading The Lord of the Rings before I realized that Pippin actually was the Prince of the Halflings in a sense, right? I mean, his dad is the Thane. Um, so, like, if anyone ha- should have, like, deserves the title of, uh, you know, Prince of the Halflings, it's actually Pippin. Um, I. Yeah, it was a long time later that I finally uh, uh, that I finally realized that. But anyhow, kind of embarrassing. But um, uh, but again, notice how Pippin is referring to you know uh, little Pippin, right? Is has this experience where he is connecting Mister Peregrine of Tuckborough, who is already clearly in little Pippin's mind, right? Obviously known to the family and yet also this legendary figure, right? Though a legendary figure that he obviously feels closely connected to as he, yeah, uh, it, he is his namesake. And, and so he, you know, sort of jumps in to, uh, defend Pippin against the, the, the Mariotic praiser, uh, his brother, Mary, of course. Um, but he alludes to the role that, again, he, in in uh, in, he cites a thing, of course, that he has seen himself. He's got hair that's almost golden, right? Um, and but then he cites something clearly from the stories, right? And asks his dad for confirmation that that part of the story is really true and still true, right? That they call Pippin the prince of the halfling still down in Minas Tirith, right? So again, the thing that I think is really interesting here is the kind of meta-narrative, right, of the Red Book, which is the Lord of the Rings, right? There within the story of the Lord of the Rings and a character from the Lord of the Rings reading the Lord of the Rings to other characters in the Lord of the Rings who know those characters, but also primarily know them as stories, right? And so the way in which this is kind of interacting with itself. This glimpse that we get into the reception of stories and this kind of transition. Again, on the stairs of Carathongol, we get Sam and Frodo reflecting back on Baron and Luthien, right? Who are just characters from stories, right? Mostly, except like they've met relatives of them, fairly near relatives. Uh, but nevertheless, like to them, they're characters out of stories and there's, you know, them themselves. Right. So there's Frodo and Sam in the real story and they're thinking about it. And, you know, we're in a story, too, of course, but not like that. Yeah, or at least not like that yet. Um, and now we can see kind of both of these things together. And, you know, the status that Mr. Mariotic and Mr. Peregrine have here is a really interesting, uh, a, a really interesting um uh, uh, kind of transition, right? Um, between the two, we can see them already taking their place in the Baron and Luthien camp, right? Um, and yet they're also real people and real, real life role models as well to little Mary and little Pippin. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Kate says, I can so imagine Mary and Pippin Gamgee arguing over who was the most heroic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and of course, Frodo, the idea that uh, the, the, the sort of delicious fun of Frodo lad who looks just like Sam being the one who says that he wants to hear about the spider again. Right. Can I hear about the part where you defeated Sheila, Dad? Right. I like best the parts where you come in. Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the way in which the Frodo lad character, you know, you can see his affinity, his his love for and his affinity for his dad. Right. He shares Frodo's name, but, you know, looks up, clearly looks up to his to Sam as a hero and loves the heroic bits about Sam. Um, uh, just as Sam always looked up to Frodo. Uh, so the kind of circularity of that is really, really delightful. Um, but of course we can see the, we've, we've established the pattern, right? Mary looks up to Mariotic. Pippin looks up to Mr. Peregrine. Frodo lad looks up to Sam. Right. And we can see the hero worship that he has for his father in the same way. And again, that, that, that the one named for Frodo uh, should 
be trying to, uh, sort of apparently trying to follow in the footsteps of his own father, of Sam. Um, you know, in just the way that Mary and Pippin are trying to follow their namesakes is adorable. And also it, it sort of feels like it kind of closes the loop uh, in some way. <laughs> Kate, Kate suggests next myth mood. We should reenact this scene. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can survive it. I mean, oh, just think of uh, the casting. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's keep going. And yeah, I, it is, I believe, Frodo Lad who wants an axe so he can go hunting orcs uh, as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Eleanor speaking, of course. When can I go and see? I want to see elves, Dad, and I want to see my own flower. If you look in a glass, you'll see one that is sweeter, said Sam, though I should not be telling you, for you'll find it out soon enough for yourself. But that isn't the same. I want to see the green hill and the white flowers and the golden and hear the elves sing. Well, then maybe you will one day, said Sam. I said the same when I was your age and long after, and there didn't seem no hope, and yet it came true. "'But the elves are sailing away still, aren't they? "'And soon there'll be none, will there, Dad?' said Rose. "'And then we'll all will just... "'And then all will be just places, and very nice, but... "'But... "'But what, Rosie lass? "'But not like in stories.' "'Well, it would be so if they all was to sail,' said Sam. "'But I am told they aren't sailing any more. "'The ring has left the havens, "'and those that made up their mind to stay "'when Master Elrond left are staying.' And so there'll be elves still for many and many a day. I think it should be rings. The ring... No? The ring has left the havens? Rings? Hmm. Anyway. Um, those that made up their mind to stay are staying. So there'll be elves still for many and many a day. Uh, I think of all of the passages uh, in the epilogue, this is the one that is most unexpected. Um, when Sam's like, actually, yeah, they've been, uh, they were sailing, sailing, sailing away and leaving us for a while. Most of them, like some of them, but the rest of them are sticking around, right? That, uh, that that's not happening. Yeah. Elves dad. Yeah. I was noticing the elves dad, uh, too there, James. Right. Um, yeah. Um, Elrond's sons, sons stayed, but I don't think they became mortal, Arthur. I, I think they're they're I think they're elves still. Um, they're hanging out with uh, Celebrimbor and such. They're hanging out with the king, like they'll be coming north. Um, uh, anyway, um, but uh, all right. Eleanor wants to go see elves, and Sam's immediate connection to her desire, right? Again, think now what this does with the levels of story that we see being brought together, right? On the one hand, um, there's a direct parallel, right? She has heard stories of elves and longs to see and experience elvendom for herself. Sam had the same experience, right? Hearing the stories from Mr. Bilbo. And there's an even further direct parallel, right? On the one hand... He, Sam, was getting from Bilbo stories of the Elder Days, right, passed to him from Bilbo, uh, from the, you know, research and whatever that Bilbo had done in Rivendell and the stories that he had heard there. But, of course, he was also hearing stories from Bilbo about Bilbo's own experiences among the elves. And Eleanor has a similar experience, right? She has been hearing from her father, stories and legends, no doubt, right? There, you know, certainly she has been, um, certainly she has been hearing, uh, um, uh, um, anyway, certainly she, she has been, uh, um, uh, hearing stories of the ancient days as well. Remember, uh, uh, Sam inherits those too. Um, so he's not handed them the books in Rivendell by Bilbo like he was in the very first version, which I really love, but still they will have come down to him. Right. Um, 
uh, anyway, so but, but again, the point that I'm making is we can see the parallels there, but the difference is the story that they're reading, right? Um, what Eleanor wants is all out of... Uh, um, Sam loves the stories of the Elder Days, right? He makes it clear that he loves the stories of the elder days. He memorizes the Gilgalad poem, right? He um, he asks to be heard, to be told a story of the elves before the fading time, right? That's what Sam loves most. Eleanor may also enjoy stories of elves before the fading time, but that's not what she asks after, right? Um, she is more interested in the stories of Lothlorien. Um, Sam's memories of Lothlorien, Karen Amroth, where the king met the queen, right? That's what is in her mind. Um, and uh, Brian, you're right. Also, another strong and important anti-parallel between uh, Sam and Eleanor is that Eleanor will never have her desires to see elves ridiculed like Sam's were. I mean, we don't know that she doesn't get teased by other hobbit lasses ever, but... Um, but certainly she has a an even more authoritative Bilbo, you know, as we saw in the Ivy Bush in chapter one of The Lord of the Rings, not everybody takes old Mr. Bilbo particularly seriously, right? Um, everybody takes Sam Gamgee seriously. Uh, so I don't think anybody scoffs at elves down, down the green dragon anymore. Um, uh, certainly not so much as they did in the old days. I wonder whatever came of Ted Sandyman. But anyway... Um, so, yeah, again, I'm thinking, so again, I think of sort of the status of Sam's story as a story, right? But of course, Rosie Lass, uh, here is the one who says, I agree with you, Bruce, one of the most interesting things, right? Um, her perception, and she's quite young, right? But her perception here that... If the elves sail away, if there are no more elves in the land, um, then every, all will be just places. So you can go to Lothlorien, still, after the elves are gone, right? You could go to the hill that is Karen Amroth, right? But if the elves aren't there, it'll just be a place. And... Bruce, I don't know how to answer the question, what quality do elves give to a place that makes it more than just a place, right? I, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it won't be fairy anymore. Yeah, Jennifer says something that makes rocks remember them, apparently. Yeah, um... Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Brian, you're right that on the one hand, Eleanor seems to have uh, she, she seems to have the greatest interest in the parts of the Elvish stories that are directly related to her. That is the parts that are about her flower, which is what she's named after. And you're right that that's not an unusual perspective for a child to have. Um, but she's also not she's 15 now. Right. So she is still young, obviously, still you know, uh, uh, only in her teens, right, as Mary was when he first saw Bilbo disappear with the ring, um, still at an irresponsible young age, but no longer a, a very small child either. Um, yeah. Uh, Mary, I agree at the very least, uh, a sense of, uh, a sense of, a sense of timelessness, a sense of otherness, Right. Um, that kind of otherness that fairy has compared to the human realms. I mean, Lothlorien, crossing the boundaries of Lothlorien, right, was entering fairy, right? You are no longer really in the human realms. Did time even flow the same way there, right, is, is uh, uh, an uncertainty that they have when they're there. Um, certainly, if you go there, it's just, it's just a place. The other thing that I think of, Bruce, when I'm trying to answer this question is I remember that passage in Leaf by Niggle um, uh, when Niggle is exploring. It's in when he goes to the tree, not in his painting, but when he goes to the tree. And 
in the place which is his painting brought to life, he's able to go to the places that were like just the blue distance and they retain the quality of being distant while still he's able to go and see them. Um, that seems to me a kind of a, um, a kind of a, a gesture towards something like this, right? Like the, the, the kind of the quality of wonder and magic in a very broad sense. Again, we know how, you know, uncomfortable Tolkien was with that word, but that sense of enchantment um, that sometimes certain circumstances will lend, you know, will, will, will lend a place in our world, these qualities, right? But it can easily lose it and become just a place, right? Whether it's the shifting, you know, whether it's uh, the kind of the wonder and mysterious beauty that is cast on a place at a particular time, say, oh, I don't know, in the gloaming, right? Um, which, by the noon sun, would maybe just be a place, right? Um, think about when Tolkien talks about recovery, right? That sense of wonder that is recovered, right? Elves seem to lend places that kind of wonder uh, in a preeminent degree, right? Um, but the way that Rosie Lass says it, they will all be just places, is, I think, a fascinating encapsulation of this idea of a place which might be very nice, right? But if it lacks that special enchantment that is given to it by elves or by fantasy or whatever, it'll just be a place and not like in stories, its story itself also that lends that thing. So um, remember Sam's own comment, right? Like he felt that he was inside a song, right? Um, that seems to be the same insight that Rosie Lass is herself here having. Where else do places have that enchantment, have that sense of mystery? In stories, right? When you are imagining them in stories, so that one of the effects, at least in... Rosie Lass's understanding, right? One of the effects of uh, an elvish blessing, of elvish enchantment and magic in a place, is that it is one of the only places, is the only one of the only ways where you can go to a place which is a real place in our world, but it is like being inside a story, right? Um, yeah, having fairy in the primary world, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, this is, um, this is, a, I just, it's a really interesting thing that Tolkien is trying to capture here. And Rosie's, Rosie Lass's very simple, uh, statement of it, uh, is, um, is really amazing, I think. Um, yeah, um, but... Sam's assurance that the elves aren't sailing anymore is interesting, right? The fourth age won't be a time. So, and this this is one of those things that I would throw out there as examples of what, what I was alluding to earlier on, right? About how, um, although Tolkien did not, you know, send the text to print uh, with this passage still in it, I don't know that there's any reason to think that this isn't, you know, this isn't authoritative as far as, like, his concept about how it works. Um, it's an interesting cautionary reminder, right, uh, that we think about the dominion of men, right, and we've talked even in this class about things like the, you know, the thinking about Arwen, right, as this link back to the elder days, and, and you know, she's the the, the last lingering of the elder days into Middle Earth, and, and of course being the mother of the line of the king, um, you know, is, uh, uh, is, is sort of integrating in that sense the memory, uh, the, even sort of the genetic memory, right, of, uh, uh, of, of, of elves in the elder days into, uh, into the dominion of men. It's going to be the dominion of men, but that doesn't mean it's going to be the absolute monopoly of men, right? The magic, the enchantment, the elvishness, the elves are not going to completely vanish from the world, right? 
they're they are going to fade, uh, Carrie, absolutely. Um, and Mary is saying that too. They are going to fade, but they're not vanished, right? They're, they're, they, 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 you know, the elves haven't left Middle Earth and switched off the lights behind them on their way out, right? Um, that is the one thing that Sam is assured of. So maybe, you know, maybe the day will come when there won't be any elves. But see again, it's not going to be a black. It's it's not going to be a black and white. As we might have guessed had we thought about it more clearly, it's going to be a gloaming, right? Remember back to some of the those oldest poems that Tolkien ever wrote. Think back to Cortirian Among the Trees. If you can remember that, gosh, when was it that we did Book of Lost Tales Volume 1 in the Mythgard Academy? Wasn't that 2014, maybe? Maybe late 2014, something like that? Gosh, it was five years ago. Holy cow. Anyway, um... If you remember way back when we talked about Cortirian Among the Trees, um, that idea, right, that there were certain places in modern England um, where you could just sense that there was a memory of the elves, right? Um, you know, they're not actively present. You don't meet them or anything like that. But um, but some memory of them, some effect of the elves lingers. And at certain times and in certain seasons, you can get some faint glimpses of this and that, right? That idea, um, inspired not by ancient stories in a sense, but by in, by the modern world, right? Um, you know, this is these are poems about the modern world and its memory of the ancient days. He's not writing poems there about just about the old world. Um, anyway, that's way back to some of Tolkien's very very first work, right? A lot of this stuff. I mean, you can you can argue that all of Middle Earth began as Tolkien trying to write stories to to basically accomplish exactly this, right? To, to sort of, to try to capture that last lingering, you know, uh, the, the elvish enchantment in the modern world, right, is approaching zero, right? It's, it's coming down like an asymptote to zero, but it's not at zero, right? And there was a time in the past when it was greater, right? When the, when the contact was greater and closer, um, and Sam is basically, okay, that idea doesn't seem to have changed either. That is what the dominion of men is going to be like. Not all of the elves are gone and there are no elves anymore. Um, but Sam is dimly anticipating, right, that in the future, the situation will be something like Tolkien wrote about, um, in, uh, Cortirian Among the Trees, right? All right, let's keep going. This passage makes me laugh out loud. I hadn't read this in so long. Uh, uh, oh, can I make a, another confession? I didn't read the epilogue for a really, really long time. Even after I knew it existed, I didn't read it. Um, the reason is a little bit silly. I don't know if any of you have this impulse either. I found out. When I found out that this epilogue existed, instead of rushing to read it right away as soon as I could, I put off reading it. For like 20 years, I put off reading it. Um, because I didn't want to... I, knowing that it existed, knowing that there was a part of The Lord of the Rings that I hadn't read yet, uh, it was like it wasn't over. <laughs> I, don't, I, it's, 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 I don't know if any of you have this impulse, right? Uh uh, this impulse to uh, to kind of save something, right? Um, it's sort of the same reason uh, that I haven't read. Uh, there's at least one or two Shakespeare plays that I haven't read, and I know I haven't read them, and I refuse to read them, uh, be <laughs> because when I do, I will have read all the Shakespeare, and there won't be any new Shakespeare for me uh, to read someday. Um, anyway, that's uh, so exactly, Mary. It's really about not wanting the Lord of the Rings to end, right? So. Uh, so yeah, I put off reading it literally for decades, and then I finally read it. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway. Um, but anyway, this passage still makes me laugh out loud. Um, still, I think it was very sad when Master Elrond left Rivendell and the lady left Lorien, said Eleanor. What happened to Celeborn? Is he very sad? I expect so, dear. Elves are sad. That's what makes them so beautiful and why we can't see much of them. 
He lives in his own land, as he has always, as he always has done, said Sam. Lorien is his land, and he loves trees. No one else in the world hasn't got a Malorn like we have, have they, said Mary. Only us and Lord Celeborn. So I believe, said Sam. Secretly, it was one of the greatest prides of his life. Well, Celeborn lives among the trees, and he is happy in his elvish way, I don't doubt. That's the sentence that makes me laugh. <laughs> is he sad? I expect he is. So he's happy. He's happy in his elvish way, I don't doubt. They can afford to wait, elves can. His time has not come yet. The lady came to his land, and now she is gone, and he has the land still. When he tires of it, he can leave it. So with Legolas, he came with his people, and they live in the land across the river, Ithilien, if you can say that, and they've made it very lovely, according to Mr. Pippin, but he'll go to the sea one day, I don't doubt, but not while Gimli's still alive. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, Nancy, was there a character in Lost who did the same thing? Yeah. Uh, read the entire work of Dickens except one book that he kept with him at all times? Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I did that with Chaucer for a long time, too. That was one of the Canterbury... I'm forgetting which one it was. I did break down and read it before my orals. Uh, but there was one of the Canterbury Tales I was putting off reading for the same reason, I have to confess. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, Nancy, exactly. Being sad sad is elvish for happy. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like that, right? And Bruce, yeah, K is for Celeborn. Notice, uh, in his footnotes, um, in his footnotes, Christopher mentioned that, like, in the process of writing the letter, Tolkien changed his mind. You may remember way back, Celeborn was originally written with a K, and then he changed it to a C, though still a hard C sound, and, like, in middle of writing this <laughs> final epilogue, he's like, nah, let's go back to K, actually. In some ways, I almost wished uh, that... Uh, I almost wished that he would have just gone back to K throughout, because then no one would ever have mispronounced it. Um, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> Karita, I agree. Happy in his elvish way. Is a, is, a, is a delightful phrase, right? Is he very sad? I expect so, dear. Elves are sad, and that's what makes them so beautiful, and why we can't see much of them. My goodness, there is so much in that sentence, I don't even know where to start. The beauty of the elves lies at least in part in their sadness. And their sadness... And beauty is also why we can't see much of them, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, see, Bruce, I can understand people who, like, grew up pronouncing... I mean, I did, too. When I was a kid, I pronounced it Celeborn. Um, I remember reacting with great indignation the first time somebody told me that it was a hard C, and I didn't believe them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yep, yep. No, that's uh, that can be kind of a hard one. Um yeah, Kate, and then there's the Boston basketball team, and I just, yeah, I, I can't even. Um, yeah. So, Raymond, is is it a is it a reference to one of the themes of the Aino Indole? It's hard not to remember it, right? Um, that, you know, it was, it was sad and from, you know, uh, it was full of sorrow and from that sorrow, its beauty chiefly came, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's certainly where we have seen that connection between beauty and sadness again. Mary was just thinking the same thing, yeah, whose beauty comes from, the, the theme whose beauty comes from its sorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, um... I don't know. I think I need to think about that sentence a lot more. 
Like, I'll come back in another five years, and maybe then I'll be ready to talk about this sentence more, especially the last part, and why we can't see much of them. Here's my current theory as to what that clause means, and why we can't see much of them. Elves are sad, and that's what makes them so beautiful, and why we can't see much of them. Because elves know that mortals have a different relationship with sadness. Um, elves are different. They can afford to wait, elves can, Sam goes on to say. Right? He is happy in his elvish way. They can afford to wait. His time has not come yet. So, he's sad because Galadriel left and he stayed. Right? Now, one might be tempted... Um, one might be tempted to say, dude, like, if you're, go with her then. I mean, seriously, did somebody nail you down? Like, why can't you go? If you're, I mean, like, right, like, why sit around and mope about it? Go find her again. Go be with your wife and stop whining, right? I mean, I, what, you can see why somebody might think that. Um, but that's because it's not how elves think, right? You know, the uh, even just if you think about that whole line of thinking, right? The line of thinking which says, are you feeling sad? Go do something about it. Rectify that situation, right? That's a very mortal way of thinking about things, right? Elves can afford to wait. You know, this period of sadness is something that he is going through, right? Um, he, Celeborn is still kind of torn in two, right? He had his land. And then his lady came, and he had both his land and his lady, and then his lady left, and now he still has his land, right? And he loves his land. He does, doesn't yet want to leave his land, but he's sad that his lady's gone. Um, but, you know, big picture, long view of things, right? And why, and exactly, Tarlonio, once he follows the lady, the land is gone forever. Uh, at least it'll just be a place after he leaves. So, why then can't we see much of them because of their sadness and their beauty? And I think the answer is they know that mortals experience... Like, sadness is different to mortals, right? Um, elves can afford to wait. They... Um, sadness isn't something that needs... To, they don't seem to feel the need to alleviate sadness right away. Because again, long view, right? Um, long view. Um, and yeah, Kate says it must also be a sort of blindness on our part. We can't see much of them, uh, not that they don't show themselves to us. Possibly uh, that that's part of why we don't see them. Um, maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah. Um, Brian, I agree. This is a mortal trying to explain elves, right? And, you know, look, if any of the elves, or, or, or mortals, sorry, if any of the mortals, especially any of the hobbits, understand elves, it's got to be... Sam's got to understand elves better than any hobbit alive. Right? At least any hobbit in Middle-earth, right? Uh, that seems fairly safe to me, actually, right? Um, but... Um, but still, yeah, I mean, this is still a mortal trying to... And, and so what do we see whenever Sam tries to capture in mortal, like in a mortal framework, what the elves are like? What does he do? He always ends up, um, you know, like contradicting himself, right? Doing the, you know, the happy and sad, so old and young, so happy and sad, right? That kind of thing. It seems to me that this is... Um, that this is very similar, right? Um, that this is... Uh, um, they're sad. He's sad and happy, right? Um, he's happy in his elvish way. A.K.A. he's sad. Um, and yes, as Mary uh, and as uh, Raymond were recalling the fact that Sam also links this back to the linking between sorrow and beauty in the Aino Indole, um, also suggests that Sam, he's well aware that there is something really profound here, even if it's 
not something that necessarily communi communicates itself really clearly to mortals. And I certainly feel that I am one of the mortals to whom this mystery has not communicated itself, communicated itself perfectly, clearly, yet. Like I said, come back to me. Maybe I'll understand this passage better in 20 years. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Christopher says, It's fair to say that Sam certainly understands the love of the elves for their land in a way that other hobbits won't. That is interesting. Also, I wonder if Sam understands their sadness in another way, too, in that he is happy in his family, but despite Frodo's best efforts, he's still a bit torn in two. Yeah. Um, he is whole, but, but I hear you, Christopher. He's not forgotten, right? And we'll get to that. I'd better move on, or we're not going to get to that. All right. And does Legolas go to see Treebeard? asked Eleanor. I can't say, dear, said Sam. I've never heard of anyone as has ever seen an Ent since those days. If Mr. Merry or Mr. Pippin have, they keep it secret. Very close, are Ents. And have they never found the Ent wives? Well, we've never seen... Well, we've seen none here, have we? said Sam. No, said Rosie Lass, but I look for them when I go in a wood... I would like the ant wives to be found. So would I, said Sam. But I'm afraid this that is an old trouble, too old and too deep for folks like us to mend, my dear. But now no more questions tonight, at least not till after supper. Too old, that is an old trouble, too old and too deep for folks like us to mend. Um, yeah, yeah, um... In the revised version, he says, maybe the ant wives don't want to be found, right? Uh, in the context of talking about the secrecy of uh, um, of the ants, uh, you know, and how how uh, how close the ants are, and how they have no love for mortals, um, it's easy for me to remember the animosity of the old forest, right? The enmity of the old forest, not just with all that go on two legs and in general, but with the hobbits of the Shire in particular, um, with whom they have a long-standing quarrel. Um, Sam is, after all, a gardener, which, again, it's easy to think Sam is like Mr. Plant Guy, right? I mean, a lot of I've heard people say, like, oh, tree, like, hot, like Sam would be Treebeard's favorite dude, Right? Wouldn't Sam and Treebeard get on? Well, I was about to say like a house on fire, which is probably not a metaphor, you know, a simile one should use when talking about ants. Um, but anyway, you'd think so, right? And yet, I'm not sure actually, because Sam's a Sam's a gardener, right? He uh, he prunes plants, and he, uh, you know, he's much more like the ant wives than like the ants, according to the song, right? According to Treebeard's own account. Um, exactly, Tarlonial. Sam is about tamed nature, not untamed nature. Absolutely. Um, he is... Uh, he likes order and control, right, in his garden. Um, he doesn't just let plants grow naturally. Like the ant wives, um, but unlike the ants. So, in fact, you know, I'm not sure that um, uh, Sam the gardener and uh, Treebeard would necessarily have seen eye to eye. Um, I'm sure that Treebeard would not have reacted to Sam like the old forest reacts to the brandy bucks, but, um, you know, there might be an element, right, of that in there, too. Um <laughs> Karita, Karita qu quoting Rosie saying, I look for them when I go in a wood. And Karita says, me too, Rosie. <laughs> me too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I love that. Um, that sense, Karita, right? You know, think about, I think of when I, when I read this passage, I think about those letters um, from the published letters where Tolkien is responding to people asking about the ant wives and he gives different kinds of answers. Right. But, um, uh, he knows, right? He knew even before readers were reading it, right? Even before it went to print, e even here, this is the first manuscript, right? This is part of that continuous manuscript. And he already knew that, uh, you know, people would be looking in the woods for ant wives, right? Um, it is part of the 
it is part of the mythic power of the story of the Ensign Ant Wives that he himself kind of stumbled onto, right? Uh, stumbled into, really. Um, uh, you know, he kind of became a part of that story, too. Uh, remember how... Um, remember how quickly the... Uh, um, the story of, you know, the chapter, the Treebeard chapter, wrote itself once he discovered what he really was and how Ents really worked, right? Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. What else was I going to talk about here? No, I think I'm good. No more questions. Except then the truth about the letter comes out. It came from the South Farthing Post three days ago, written above on Wednesday, said Eleanor. I saw it. It was wrapped in silk and sealed with big seals. Quite right, my bright eyes, said Sam. Now look, he unrolled it. It is written in elvish and in plain language, said Sam. And it says, Elessar Aragorn Arathornson, the Elfstone, King of Gondor and Lord of the Westlands, will approach the bridge of Baranduin on the first day of spring, or in the Shire Reckoning, the 25th day of March next, and desires there to greet all his friends. In especial, he desires to see Master Samwise, Mayor of the Shire, and Rose, his wife, and Eleanor, Rose, Goldilocks, and Daisy, his daughters, and Frodo, Merry, and Pippin, and Hamfast, his sons. There you are. There are all your names. Again, this is such a father moment, right? I, you know, it takes a father to know how much it would mean to the kids to see their own names on the letter from the king, right? Uh, and for, you know, for him to give that particular wisdom to Aragorn, right? Uh, that, that particular wisdom and thoughtfulness um uh to uh uh to include their like to think of that right to include their names i mean presumably they would have brought the kids anyway or he could have just said um in a special he desires to see master samwise mayor of the shire and rose his wife and their many progeny right he could have just said something like that right but no he includes the names because he's awesome right and tolkien thinks to make him be awesome in that particular way uh because tolkien knows kids um christopher yes good especially when the child is just learning to read absolutely absolutely um yes yes <laughs> aragorn does have excellent manners when he wants to uh nancy i agree um yes absolutely um and uh, <laughs> Boomful is saying, also assume any children uh, uh, born while this letter was in transit. Yeah, now he probably would have had to send a scribe along with the letter, right, uh, to update it as they were traveling. Right, hard to stay current uh, on the state of uh, the Gamgee family establishment here. Um, but anyhow... Um, yeah, Arthur. Yes, that of that's the thing that the one word that jumps off the page to me so, uh, uh, as much as anything else here is Arathorn's son, uh, with the double S. Right. Um, I don't remember seeing that anywhere else either. Um, I mean, that's that's very uh, sort of Norse, right? Um, I mean, that's like just how people are named in Iceland, right? Or Denmark or something like that. Um, but we don't, I can't think of a single example of a name like that, um, in, uh, in the Lord of the Rings. No, Viggo Mortensen doesn't count, Arthur. <laughs> no. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, uh, yeah, it, that is interesting. I mean, not interesting that it is not strange, of course, uh, that he calls himself Aragorn, son of Arathorn. Um, but it is strange uh, that he writes it like that. Um, nothing else is strange other than the duplication of Elessar and Elfstone. That is, you know, once in... Uh, um, you know, once in regular language, or plain language, as Sam calls it, and once in Elvish. Um, 
the date, of course. He is coming to meet them on the 25th day of March next. Um, and Tolkien, of course, has two different impulses with the 25th of March. Remember, there are two things, uh, two reasons that the 25th of March is super important, right? Um, uh, and that is um, uh, the... Obviously, it is the the date of the downfall, you know, the date of the destruction of the ring, the date of the end of the War of the Rings, uh, the fir, you know, the, it's Gondorian New Year's Day. Um, but of course, locally, it is also Eleanor's birthday, right? Um, but uh, the king has chosen that day. So, it, it, and I love how that comes across in the letter, right? Um no one is going to be more familiar than Sam with the significance of that date, right? And so that Aragorn, the king, says, I'm going to meet you on the 25th of March, is to say, like, I'm going to, like, the most important day in the Gondor, you know, the most important holiday in the Gondorian calendar, I, I, I would like to spend it with you this year, right? I would like for us to meet on Gondorian New Year, on the day of the destruction of the ring, to remember Frodo. I mean, I think it's 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 a kindness to Sam in that way, right? To remember Frodo and what Frodo did, you know, the, the casting of the ring into the fire. Um, uh, and also, of course, you know, Sam also helped, you know, and being a big part of that. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, yeah... Uh, the, the significance of like I'm gonna you know I'm leaving Gondor behind I won't be home, I, I won't be celebrating Gondorian New Year in Gondor this year, instead uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share it with you guys is really cool and yeah Craig war forged friendships are like that I agree, um, absolutely, um, yeah. Now of course Tolkien changes that he changes the date. Uh, because he decides uh, to like the, you know, like the April 8th or something like that, because he decides that instead of having their meeting happen on the 25th, he decides that he wants the day in which the epilogue is occurring to be on the 25th, for that to be Eleanor's birthday, uh, for that to be the day when Sam is recalling the ring going into the fire, so that he can have that conversation with Rose at the end, right? That is... Uh, uh, clearly the reason that, I mean, I say clearly, that's that's the primary effect. It's certainly the moment when Tolkien seems to have made that decision, right? When he's looking towards the end of it and saying, no, no, no. Yeah, okay, then meeting with Aragorn on the 25th is cool. It being the 25th now so that Sam in the present tense can be commenting on the significance of that anniversary is even more important. Yeah. Um Brian says that April 8th, yeah, I think you're right. I'm now forgetting because of all those date changes in the drafts that we just recently read. I can't remember now when it actually happens in the published text. Um, but yes, Brian was recalling that April 8th is the anniversary of the day Frodo and Sam wake up at the field of Cormallon. Um, so having that be the day when uh, Aragorn is going to meet them so that, you know, I, you know we, we will be reunited again as we were reunited on the field of Cormallon has a similar kind of, Craig, as you were suggesting, a kind of... Um, you know, like wartime anniversary, like for us to, re to for us to mark the anniversary of a really important event in this, uh, you know, in this like super important and traumatic experience that we shared together. It still had it still he still maintains that element of it. Right. While shifting it forward uh, in while still shifting it forward into April. Um, Christopher, I have to imagine that Strider is going to be staying over at the pony before that. And by the way, I hate to, so. I, I was having one of those moments today when I was rereading this and I was looking at the notes and Christopher Tolkien. So remember, there's that reference to the fact in the second version when it's just Sam and Eleanor talking and Sam tells Eleanor that um, she's met the king before because the king came when she was only a little mite. Right. Um, and Christopher footnotes that or endnotes that and says he can find no other reference to the previous visit of the king. Um, but um, I, I'm i looking at that and I'm like, I think that's a mistake, but it's, I, man, I must be, I'm like, I was sort of doubting myself. I'm like, surely Christopher Tolkien isn't, but I think he must have missed it. 
Gandalf alludes to it, right? Gandalf tells Butterbur in the inn at the in the Prancing Pony that he will soon be coming north, right? And I don't think he meant 15 years from now. So the idea that, I mean, I had always, this, even before I had read that passage, even back in my younger days, I had assumed that Aragorn came north soon as Gandalf tells Butterbur, right? In order to, like, reestablish peace in Arnor. Um, so came, like, within, like, the first at least the first year, couple years of his kingship. Then he returned to Gondor and he hasn't been back since then. Um, but I mean, I, I always took Gandalf's words to Butterbur to mean that like soon he will be coming north. And I, by soon, I did not think he meant in 15 years. Um, but um, anyway, uh, let's move on. Okay. Sam's name. Well, that's splendid, said Frodo. Now we all have elvish names. But what is yours, Dad? Well, that's rather peculiar, said Sam. For in the elvish part, if you must know, what the king says is Master Perheil, who should rather be called Lanheil. And that means, I believe, Samwise or Halfwise, who should rather be called Plainwise. So now you know what the king thinks of your dad, you'll maybe give more heed to what he says. Says Sam, turning the compliment of the king uh, into a joke, right? Um, uh, and it's interesting that in plain language, when, when translating Sam's name from plain language into Elvish, uh, Tolkien plays, of course, on the actual meaning, right? The Anglo-Saxon meaning of Samwise, uh, which does mean half-wit, um, uh, ha you know, Half wise or 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 half wit, um, which Aragorn knows full well, right? Uh, but turns it into a compliment. He should have been named plain wise, and I like plain wise, Lanhail, right? Because um, first of all, it's in the word. The choice of the word plain is the part that I like, right? Um, there's in one of the other versions he translates it as full wise instead of half wise, um, which is okay, but I like plain wise better, and the reason I like plain wise better is it sounds like Sam, right? It's actually like Aragorn in Elvish, imitating Sam's own dialect, right? Um, he's just plain wise, is how Sam might say that of somebody, right? Um, and not only that. Not only is it a phrase which sounds like it would be from Sam's own dialect, it's also a, it's also descriptive, right? He's not just plain wise in the sense of being plain wise instead of half, like, you know, just just plain wise instead of half wise, but also he is wise in a very plain way, right? The 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 the, the commonness of Sam, you know, that um, the 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 sort of low-class simplicity that always marks Sam's wisdom, right? The quality of Sam's wisdom. He is wise in a very plain way. He's not... He is book-learned, even even though he is book-learned at this time in his life. You know, it's... It, he's never just been someone with that kind of wisdom. Yes, Karita, it, it sounds like a kind of translation of Hobbit sense. Yeah, Mary... Uh, exactly. Down-to-earth and plain-spoken. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes. So, Kate, I agree with you. It's Strider language, right? Um, ironically, in the this, you know, the high elvish speech that he is uh, uh, that he is using, right? Uh, that he's translating the letter into. So it's like in the most formal register that he could be employing, and yet he is making a very Strider-like reference in which he seems to me to be even emulating Sam's own manner of speaking, right? And that's a pretty deft trick by Aragorn there, but again showing Aragorn's sensitivity. Notice the, the, what Tolkien accomplishes in this letter. On the one hand, I mean, one reaction that one could certainly have to this letter is that it hardly sounds, you know... Um, 
it doesn't exactly sound like a friendly, you know, a letter from one old friend to another. You'd think that maybe, you know, Aragorn's letter, to, you know, Strider's letter to Sam might start something like, Dear Sam, how's the wife and kids? I hear you've been busy back up in the Shire, right? I mean, like, you can totally imagine Strider talking like that. But no, we get Elessar Aragorn Arathorn, son, the Elfstone, King of Gondor, and the Lord of the Westlands will approach the bridge of Baranduin. I mean, it is as formal and stilted as it could possibly be, right? And yet, we see that despite that, like, very formal and stilted letter that Aragorn has had drawn up, uh, for Sam, yet we see all of these very personal, very intimate, very thoughtful, very charming touches by Aragorn. And the way that uh, Tolkien captures both of those things uh, is, I find that really, really, really cool, really fascinating. All right. All the children. So here's the end. Are you ready for the very end of The Lord of the Rings? All the children were in bed. Lights were glimmering still in Hobbiton and in many houses dotted about the darkening countryside. Sam stood at the door and looked away eastward. He drew Mistress Rose to him and held her close to his side. March 18th, changed to 25th, he said. This time, seventeen years ago, Rose wife, I did not think I should ever see thee again, but I kept on hoping. And I never hoped at all, Sam, she said, until that very day. And then suddenly I did. In the middle of the morning I began singing, and Father said, Quiet, lass, or the ruffians will come. And I said, Let them come. Their time will soon be over. My Sam's coming back. And he came. Change to, And you came back, said Rose. I did, said Sam, to the most belovedest place in all the world. I was torn in two then, lass, but now I am all whole. And all that I have, and all that I have had, I still have. Here the text as it was written ends, but subsequently my father added to it the following. They went in and shut the door. But even as he did so, Sam heard suddenly the sigh and murmur of the sea on the shores of Middle-earth. So Christopher, there you go, right? Uh, he is... I don't know, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm speaking to Christopher Bartlett, not Tolkien, right? Um, yes, so Christopher, as you said, as you mentioned before, right, we do still get that hint of longing, that hint of t torn intuishness, right? Um, he is whole. All that I have and all that I have had, I still have. But there's the sea, right? And there's the longing for the sea. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Christopher says, I'm not ashamed to admit that this passage brings tears to my eyes even now. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, Devore, uh, Devore, you were just saying the same thing. Yes, Sam isn't quite whole, right? There is still that longing in Sam's heart. Right, which will only be uh, settled by his taking to ship. And so we'll notice, of course, that when Tolkien comes back and rewrites this sometime later, he's going to give that, he's going to speak of this openly, right? What was only kind of hinted at, the this sort of irony at the end, right? Um, Sam's wholehearted feelings of wholeness, right, in the very end, but that recognition there in that final sentence that that's that's true it's it, it's true but it's not the entire story right um so rose's i love rose's speech i mean come on her beginning to sing their time will soon be over my sam's coming back um and you came back sounds more like Rose, but of course, I'm sure you guys are all thinking the same thing, right? And he came, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Sam Morgoth, right? And he and Morgoth came. Uh, it sounds exactly like that. I love it. I love the 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 not like paralleling, you know, Sam to the ultimate Dark Lord, but um, the majesty, the terror of it. Right. From the from the ruffians perspective, um, you know, that he um, 
uh, that Sam is, is, you know, like that Sam's feet striking the earth of the Shire as he returns will be like the, uh, the feet of Morgoth as he emerges from the gates of Thangorodrim to duel uh, 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 with Fingolfin. I mean, come on, that is fantastic. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Brian says, without that last sentence, this ending is too perfect and too happy. Now, Brian, you'll remember, this is at the end of draft A, which, as I was saying last time, is too perfect and too happy by, I think, a long shot, right? Remember, that's this is the same, this is part of the same writing, right? He's still continuously writing the same thing. All of the, like, re recuperation of Frodo's reputation in the Shire, Frodo's one-on-one -on -one duel with Sharky number two, right? Uh, all of that stuff, right? All of the all of the glory and light and, and 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 everybody being happy that we get at the end of the Lord of the Rings with none of this, almost none of the sadness, right? We still do get the parting at the Grey Havens, um, so it's not like we don't get any of the sadness at all, but, um, but anyway, much less, right? We get much less. It's the end is, was, you know, uh, this Manuscript A ending was... A super happy ending all the way through, right? Um, uh, and I do think that, you know, as we talked about last time, I do think that uh, Tolkien really kind of brought it back, you know, by, by changing that. Um, it was a, a really profound and a really important change about the end uh, of The Lord of the Rings. And, Brian, I think we can see, in, in a sense... Right, the addition of that sentence to the end here is almost like a little microcosm of the whole revisions to this this draft, right? Of what really does need to happen. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Good. Um, and Bruce, I agree with you. I'm back is a better ending, right? I love the I'm back ending. I wouldn't give up the I'm back ending. To me, this is the perfect solution, right? I love this passage. Uh, I love this passage. I love this whole epilogue. There's nothing I don't love about this epilogue. Um, I'm glad we have it, right? And now that Christopher has published it, we have it. Um, and we still have Well, I'm Back is the end of The Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, Christopher Tolkien has enabled us to, like, you know, eat our cake and have it in a way that... Um, you know, we almost never get to do, and that is uh, remarkable. Um, Arthur is concerned about Sam's use of the word thee. I'm not sure what to do with that. I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, Cause see, here's the problem. <sighs> Sam doesn't talk like that normally. That is a shift. A deliberate shift on Sam's part. This time, 17 years ago, Rose Wife, I did not think I should ever see thee again. He probably doesn't normally call her Rose Wife either. Um, you know, he probably doesn't say, Pass me the salt, Rose Wife, right? But, um,. Well, see, exactly, Mary. This is exactly what I'm kind of deliberating on, right? Um, the thing is, the is the familiar and affectionate form. And we can see Tolkien using the distinction between you and the in exactly that way in a text which he will write 
very soon after this, um, where the is used not on an occasion to elevate the formality, but in order to be more familiar, more intimate. Exactly, Mary, I am thinking of the Athrobeth here, um, which we'll get to in volume 10. Um, but um, I... Um, Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Christopher and Arthur are both recalling the time when it is used in the Lord of the Rings, um, and it's used by Eowyn, right, to Aragorn when she's dropping heavy hints, right. Um, neither have these others who go with thee, because they love thee, right? And that kind of sounds to me like an exception, not an exception, but like kind of proving my point here, right? Also, um, don't forget, so, well, Arthur, I, I, you know, Arthur says it, it seems jarring compared to the other Hobbit speech we've heard. It's, it's different. It's meant to be different. Sam is, is striking a different linguistic pose here, right? Uh, remember, this is seven, this is Sam after 17 years of, of uh, you know, Hobbit politics and book learning, right? Um, and Christopher and Arthur, um, he knows that passage very well, right? Where Eowyn is recorded using the in that way to Aragorn, right? Um, I don't think... Uh, that, um, yeah, again, I, I don't think that Tolkien is slipping up in accidentally making Sam talk like this. I think that Sam is deliberately speaking like this. Um, not because it's how he, because it's how he normally does not talk, right? Um, that he is choosing to address his wife at this time for a good reason. And as uh, Carita suggests, uh, they do have a lot of kids, so he's clearly doing something right in the sweet-talking-his-wife department, right? So maybe we should just trust Sam on this one, uh, that he knows what he's doing. Um, yeah, no, exactly. Carita says, it's you know, her explanation is that Rosie's into it, uh, and uh, he's being all cute and sweethearting it up. No, I, I, I hear you. I agree. That's my reading, too. I think it is for her benefit uh, that he is uh, that he is doing this. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, and I don't know that I'd go so far as calling it a cosplay moment, Arthur, but, uh, but you know, it's a, it's a su sweet talk. Sweet talk. Absolutely. Exactly, Raymond, right? F plain wise indeed, right? Uh, Sam... Uh, uh, this is not Sam's first rodeo by any stretch, right? Um, but I kept on hoping. Oh, and I mean, just goodness. What we could say about that, right? I mean, we could talk a long time about Sam Gamgee saying, re reflecting back to, you know, March 25th of 17 years ago and saying, but I kept on hoping. Though in this case, right, he's turning it back to Rosie herself. I did not think I should ever see thee again, but I kept on hoping. Um, and she says that she never hoped at all. Right? She'd given up until that very day. And this insight, this uh, foresight almost, that Rosie reflects, you know, came across her, um, is uh, uh yeah, yeah. Um, lovely. Wonderful. Adorable. I can't handle it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's keep, let's, go, let's keep going. We've got to look at the... Oh, second draft, except wait, one more bit from the first draft. Um, 
some more questions from the Hobbit children. Mary, remember, was to, this is right after they're told no more questions until after supper, and Mary's like, "Dude, we have to go to sleep after supper. We're not gonna. I'm not gonna get to ask any questions then." Uh, and Sam, remember, Sam is essentially says like, "Oh, you have spotted my cunning plan." Uh, but anyway, um, but though also there, I didn't, I didn't quote that because again, I had to not, I had to leave some bits out or we'd be here all night. Um, but um, uh, the bit where Sam gets all stern with him, right? Again, the, I love that. I get Sir Sam speaking like a father, right? You know, like he's affectionate with them and he's kindly and they push and push, but there comes a point where he's like done, right? And they're like, okay, dad, right? Uh, love that, love that. Like when, you know, the, the way that he can, uh, the way that he can, I get, see, it's this passage more than anything else that is the whole epilogue more than anything else. Um, if I needed... I already had Tolkien's letters, which sufficiently convinced me that Tolkien was a really good dad to his kids. Um, I was already convinced by his letters that he was a good dad to his children. But this epilogue by itself would have been enough to convince me that Tolkien was a really good father. Um, this is this is uh, this is somebody who knows a thing or two about uh, uh, not just has had experience with, but uh, knows how to handle this situation really well uh paternal hats off to tolkien uh in this passage but anyway okay about horses said mary how many horses did the riders lose in the battle and have they grown lots more and what happened to legolas's horse and what did gandalf do with shadowfax and can i have a pony soon he ended breathlessly <laughs> that's a lot more than one question you're worse than Gollum," said sam you're going to have a pony next birthday as i've told you before Legolas let his horse run back free to Rohan from Isengard, and the riders have more horses than ever, because nobody steals them any longer. And Shadowfax went in the white ship with Gandalf. Of course Gandalf wouldn't have, le wouldn't have left, them, left him behind. Now that'll have to do. No more questions. At least not till after supper. Um... That I, I, Arthur, I love that. Yes, the way he makes ho the horses sound like they, they've they've had a bumper crop of horses down there, right? You know, Mary's question: Have they grown lots more? Notice how you can see what Mary's experience is, right? Little Mary, uh, you know, raised by a gardener uh, and in far and a farmer, obviously also, right? Notice that Sam, though Sam may live in Bag End, he is clearly not living the. Um, uh, do you remember the reference that demonstrated that he is not living the gentleman's life that Bilbo and Frodo apparently lived? Did you catch that? How do we know for sure that Sam is still actually working for a living rather than living like a, a landed, the landed gentry? Did you catch that? Do you remember the limit, the time limit that he put on their visit uh, you know, that he, he doesn't doubt that Aragorn is going to invite them to come up to Inuminus with him, right? His house by the lake. Yeah, exactly, Kate. When it's time to cut the hay, right? When the hay harvest, when the time of the hay harvest comes, we've got to get back, right? Um, I, 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 I feel pretty confident that Sam is still personally involved in harvesting the hay. Uh, and undoubtedly his sons are too, right? Um, exactly. He's got to get home for haying season. Uh, so he, he might live in Bag End, right? But you can't, you can't totally take the bag shot row out of him, right? Uh, he is still living the life of an actual farmer uh, and an actual gardener. So again, Mary, raised in that environment in which they don't have horses, uh, have they grown lots more is a really adorable way for him to ask that question. Um uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, oh, Nancy, yeah, there are plenty of other horses in Valinor. That's where the Mayaris came from in the first place, right? So, uh, Shadowfax will, like, find his real people, uh, there in Valinor. Um, it's all, uh, it's all good. <laughs> Karina says she basically is this kid. Yeah. <laughs> and can I have a pony soon? Um, yeah, yeah. I love the greater detail we get on this later, that Mariotic. Uh, is going to bring home for little Mary for his birthday uh, a pony from Rohan, right? Uh, the next time that he comes back from Rohan. Uh, how awesome is that? 
Yeah. Uh, Kate Neville is wondering if Mary, little Mary, might have a dim memory of uh, Bill the Pony. Um, and we don't know exactly how old Bill the Pony was when uh, uh, when he and uh, Sam began their friendship. But um, it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, he certainly will have uh, 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 passed on by now. But yeah, maybe maybe Mary can remember him. Um, yeah, yeah. And Takako, I agree. Like they have lots of horses now because no one steals them anymore. Uh, is uh, uh, is a really wonderful answer. And again, notice notice the way in which again the Red Book just kind of comes out. Uh, and I'm thinking back to that reference to Old Saruman earlier on, right? Um, his language is just pep- Sam's language is just peppered with references to the Lord of the Rings itself, right? It's like the idiom that he speaks. Um, you're worse than Gollum. What does he mean by that? Why does he say you're worse than Gollum? Yes, string or nothing. Working two guesses into into one, right? Exactly. Um, he's 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 quoting, right? Practically quoting, right? Um, and notice here with Gollum, as before with Saruman, notice how indiscriminate he is. That is to say, like, he's he's comparing his son to Gollum. He was comparing all of his children. You know, he was essentially putting himself in the position of Saruman, calling his own children, you know, ragtag. Um, uh, because they're characters in the story, right? Remember, as Sam himself foreboded on the stairs of Kirith Ungol, even old Gollum might be good in a story, right? And it turns out, yeah, old Gollum is good in a story. Clearly. Clearly. Okay. It's getting late. Second draft. Here's the beginning of the second draft. I have fewer on the second draft. We're, we're, we're getting there. Um... And Christopher, I agree. The illusions do argue that he expects the children to be very familiar uh, with the story. Yes, exactly. Um, or at least, Christopher, the other thing that I would say, lead them to want to know the story, right? To build their anticipation towards hearing the story. Anyway. What are you doing, Sam, Dad, dear? She said at last. You said you were going to rest, and I hoped you would talk to me. Just a moment. El- El- Eleanorella, I have a hard time saying that word. Eleanorella, said Sam, as she came and, and set her arms about him and peered over his shoulder. It looks like questions and answers, she said. And so it is, said Sam. Mr. Frodo, he left the last pages of the book to me, but I have never yet durst to put hand to them. I am still making notes, as old Mr. Bilbo would have said. Here's all the many questions Mother Rose and you and the children have asked, and I am writing out the answers when I know them. Most of the questions are yours, because only you has heard all the book more than once. And she immediately says that she has uh, heard the book three times. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, Sam Dad is really interesting to me. We know, you know... Sam used the word dad all the time to talk about ham fast, right? My old dad, right? He always used to say, um, would he have addressed him as ham dad directly? It's possible, I guess, but uh, a really interesting familiar form of address uh, that Tolkien gives to Eleanor here. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, him... Sam, um, being on uncer- his uncertainty about um, the his uncertainty about how to proceed, the weight of authorship, right, um, the time that he is spending, right, he's already spent more than a decade just trying to make notes and figuring out what he can write that will be worthy of going in those last pages, right? Um, That's uh, fascinating. Um, And, uh, yeah, Kimber asks, is this the explanation of the appendices? No. Remember at the very end, 
Eleanor says it's the explanation of this, right? This epilogue is the chapter that Sam is going to write. And of course it gets cut out of the published text. How tragic. <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. But Christopher, I agree. This feels so right. Exactly like Sam, right? He would be very nervous about putting himself forward, even with Frodo's blessing. Right. And the idea, you know, how timid he would be to follow in Bilbo's and Frodo's footsteps. And, and yeah, yeah. He would take a long, long time about this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Good. Oh, so the, uh, Nancy, I agree with you. Um, this seems to be a pattern. We don't hear, uh, Sam addressing the gaffer. So, we don't know whether he ever called him Hamdad directly, you know, is if that's how he addressed him one on one. But Nancy's right. This does seem to be a bit of a a, a pattern, right? Um, Rose wife, Frodo lad, Rosie lass, right? Um, that combination of name with status, title, right? Um, seems to be a thing, right? Um, so Sam dad, Rose wife, Frodo lad, Rosie lass, it does all work, right? As a pattern. Um, and therefore suggests, um, ooh, ooh, Raymond remembers Sam calling Frodo, uh, Frodo dear, uh, Mr. Frodo dear. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, no, I think it works. I think it works. And therefore, remember, Frodo used that same turn of phrase when he was naming uh, Sam's children, right? When he was foretelling Sam's children. Frodo lad will come and Rosie lass, right? Um, uh, you know, the, the, it was from Frodo that we first heard those expressions. Um, so, yeah. I would suspect, perhaps, that Frodo... It, it sounds like a, a lower class thing. Like, it sounds like part of Sam's dialect, not Frodo's dialect. But um, but there I could imagine in that speech, Frodo calling the children what Sam is going to call the children. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, that Sam dad kind of took me by surprise, but yeah, the more we think it through, the more sense that seems to make. I love this metaphor. Back to the elves. I was afraid they were all sailing away, Sam dad. Then soon there would be none here, and then everywhere would be just places and, and what, Eleanorella? And the light would have faded. I know, said Sam. The light is fading, Eleanorella. But it won't go out yet. It won't ever go quite out, I think now, since I have had since I have had you to talk to. For it seems to me now that people can remember it who have never seen it. And yet, he sighed, even that is not the same as really seeing it like I did. Like really being in a story, said Eleanor. A story is quite different, even when it is about what happened. I wish I could go back to old days. Folk of our sort often wish that, said Sam. You came at the end of a great age, Eleanorella. But though it's over, as we say, things don't really end sharp like that. It's more like a winter sunset. The high elves have nearly all gone now with Elrond, but not quite all. And those that didn't go will wait now for a while. And the others, the ones that belong here, will last even longer. There are still things for you to see, and maybe you'll see them sooner than you hope. Okay. Um, so much here. The light would have faded. The light won't ever go 
quite out. So here you can see in this conversation, Tolkien again trying to capture that same thing, the just places thing. I get, I'm a little disappointed at how just place, you know, like they will be just places. Gets, it's still there, but it's kind of shunted aside. It's not given the same focus that it is when Rosie says it in the other version, um, which I like very much better. Uh, Tolkien still mentions it, but he seems to want to come down now more strongly on the second point, or the second metaphor. The light would have faded. Um, and I like the extension of that metaphor, especially the, the, the simile that he goes on to make to the winter sunset. It's like a winter sunset. Um, things don't really end sharp like that. It's not all of a sudden dark. Um, yeah. Nancy, I'm not 100% sure why it's like a winter sunset specifically. Um, it's like a sunset in that, you know, you don't just switch off the lights and the whole world goes black immediately, right? Um, again, to imagine the elves just vanishing from Middle-earth and suddenly the light is totally gone from Middle-earth is like imagining a, an evening without the gloaming, right? Just daytime, 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 night. And of course we know the elves love the gloaming, right? The gloaming is a very elvish time, so uh, it seems fit to compare it to sunset and the gloaming. Um, but it seems to me... Perhaps there is something in the quality of sunset in winter that Sam is thinking of that I am not able to think of, probably because I spend so much less time outside than Sam did. Um, but certainly the fact that it seems to happen too soon, Nancy, as you're suggesting, right, the soonness of a winter sunset, um, that it's sunset all of a sudden when you felt like the day was barely you know, getting along, right? Um, perhaps in that sense, like uh, he's comparing it to a winter sunset in order to capture the, um, uh, the, the, I won't say, I was about to say how premature it was, but premature doesn't seem like the right word, right? Soon. Let's just stick with soon. Yeah. Um, untimeliness. Yeah, but see, again, James, that suggests that the timing is wrong, which I don't, it's not wrong. It's just come sooner than uh, uh, you would want it to come, right? And that is certainly like a winter sunset. Um, the other thing, of course, is, uh, Julie, as you're suggesting, um, not only does it come too soon, but it also, of course, leaves us in the cold, right? That sense of the, the, the bitterness and the desolation <clears throat> of Middle-earth without the elves, Um is is like a winter, much more like a winter night than like a summer's night, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that that's what he's comparing it to. Um, yeah, good. Um, but it's still gloaming, right? Um, there are still things for you to see. The other passage that I really love here. For it seems to me now that people can remember it who have never seen it. It won't ever go quite out, I think, now, since I have had you to talk to. He used to think that the light, used, the light was going to go quite out. Here, I don't think he's alluding to the fact that, turns out, not all the elves are going to leave after all. He used to think they were going to all go sailing, and now he doesn't think they're all going to go sailing. So he's like, phew, the light won't go out completely. That's not, I think, what he's referring to here, right? Um, he thinks now that it won't go out because of how he now understands better from having seen it from all angles, right? the impact of story. Just as we had before, the link between what elves do to the world and what stories do to the world is being made here again, right? And he sees... Uh, his words are so delightfully double-sided, 
right? It won't ever go quite out, I think, now since I have had you to talk to. It means two things. On the one hand, it means you are the light, right? I no longer worry about the light going out because I have you. And not only just because I love you and you bring light to my life, but also because the elvish light, he sees the elvish light living on in Eleanor the Fair, right? Um, he can see clearly, certainly, at least as clearly, right, as anyone else, that uh, the elvish light lives on in his daughter. So he's complimenting her, and he's talking about how much he loves her, but it's more than that, too, right? Um, since I have had you to talk to, and in talking to her, he sees that the light in her still lingers. Not just the light that she shines herself through her own beauty and her own love and her own elvishness. Um, instead, the desire in her, right? She will keep the light alive because of her relationship to the stories. The, 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 what has been awoken in her by the stories that she has heard from him has shown him, since he's had her to talk to, that the light won't ever go quite out. Because we who hear the stories keep the light alive. And Eleanor is the first, right? She is the first generation of those to keep the light alive because they know the stories, right? Um, and it's not the same, right? And she will get a chance, maybe there are still things for her to see and maybe she'll see them soon, like, you know, within the next couple of weeks. Um... But uh, exactly, Christopher, we readers remember these things that we've never seen. The way that Sam, through this comment, kind of even glances at. Again, remember, this is where the metatextuality of this comes in again, right? As Sam is literally talking to a reader of The Lord of the Rings, right? Eleanor is, a, is, a, is, is, is a, the audience of The Lord of the Rings. Um, and here we are outside the story, hearing him within the story, talking about the effect of reading the story that we're reading, right? Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So exactly, Michelle, as long as people are passing the stories on, um, then not only the memory of the light, but the light itself won't ever quite go out. Um, again, it's not the same but it's, it's not darkness either. It's like the winter sunset, right? Um, <laughs> it just occurs to me in its way. It's like the opposite of, uh, uh, of Winterfell, right? It's the opposite of the Starks in Game of Thrones, right? Winter is coming, except winter never fully gets here, right? Not as long, you know, the, the winter sunset still lingers. The cold and the dark, f far from being, uh, coming inescapably is, um, uh, uh, will never fully arrive so long as there are those who uh, remember the stories and pass them on. All right. <sighs> okay. Ready for some more feels? Here we go. Eleanor was silent for some time before she spoke again. I did not understand at first what Celeborn meant when he said goodbye to the king, she said, but I think I do now. He knew that Lady Arwen would stay, but that Galadriel would leave him. I think it was very sad for him, and for you, dear Sam Dad. Her hand felt for his, and his brown hand clasped her slender fingers. For your treasure went too. I am glad Frodo of the Ring saw me, but I wish I could remember seeing him. It was sad, Eleanorella, said Sam, kissing her hair. It was, but it isn't now. For why? Well, for one thing. Mr. Frodo has gone where the elven light isn't fading, and he deserved his reward. But I have had mine, too. I have had lots of treasures. I am a very rich hobbit. And there is one other reason, which I shall whisper to you, a secret I have never told before to no one, nor put in the book yet. Before he went, Mr. Frodo said that my time maybe would come. I can wait. I think maybe we haven't said farewell for good, but I can wait. I have learned that much from the elves, at any rate. They are not so troubled about time. And so I think Celeborn is still happy among his trees, in an elvish way. His time hasn't come, and he isn't tired of his land yet. When he is tired, he can go. 
And when you're tired, you will go, Sam Dad. You will go to the havens with the elves. Then I shall go with you. I shall not part with you, like Arwen did with Elrond. Maybe, maybe, said Sam, kissing her gently. And maybe not. The choice of Luthien and Arwen comes to many. Eleanorella, or something like it. And it isn't wise to choose before the time. Oh, man. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this. First of all, um, this is so much fuller and so much better an explanation of the Celeborn thing. It doesn't sound comical like it did before, right? Oh, I think he's sad. So he's happy in an elvish kind of way. I mean, I, I love that from before. It's 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 really Sam. It's very funny. Um, but uh, but this is so much clearer, right? And the way in which Sam connects it to himself, the way that we can see Tolkien thinking through um, exactly what we were noticing before, right? That Sam being whole now, right? Not torn in two, completely whole, except not 100% whole, maybe 98% whole, right? Um, we can see Tolkien processing that more. And the way that he now brings back the Celeborn references and brings it squarely into Sam's context, right? I can wait. I can wait. Um, I think maybe we haven't said farewell for good, but I can wait. I have learned that much from the elves, at any rate. Um, that is absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, Eleanor's insight that Frodo is to Sam as Galadriel is to Celeborn is a fascinating insight, right? A fascinating insight for his daughter to have, who never met Frodo and never saw Sam interacting with Frodo, right? But has read the book, so she knows, right? She's read the book three times. She knows how her dad felt about Frodo and doubtless has had many, many um, uh, times to see, you know, Sam talking about Frodo and uh, reflecting on it. Um, I am glad Frodo of the Ring saw me, but I wish I could remember seeing him. Oh, man. Um, her gentle insight into how much Frodo means to Sam and to how deeply uh, and profoundly Sam loves Frodo uh, is, 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 is wise and beautiful and touching. And his response, not denying it at all, right? He doesn't deny it at all. It's perfectly true, right? But notice his response. It was sad. Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, him Him being... He was sad like Celeborn was sad when Goadriel left. But it isn't now. He's not sad now. In that sense, he is whole. He's not just faking it, right? He is whole. Why? For a couple reasons, right? Um, he's not sad that Frodo is gone because his love for Frodo is strong enough that he doesn't want Frodo to stay with him and be miserable, right? Um, he knows that Mr. Frodo has the elven light that isn't fading, and he deserved his reward, right? He is happy for Frodo to be happy and at peace, where only he could be at peace, right? As he could not do here. But also, I have had mine too. I have had my reward. I have had lots of treasures. And he brings that word back, right? Um, that word which is not Yes, for your treasure went too. She does quote it. Um, she alluded to it, right, by alluding to the to the quote uh, from Celeborn to Aragorn. Uh, but she does say the word, for your treasure went too. I have had lots of treasures. I am a very rich hobbit, right? Yes, Frodo was his treasure, like Goadriel was a treasure to Celeborn. But he has many treasures, right? He has been given... Rosewife 
and all of his children, and each one of them is also his treasure. He doesn't love Frodo the less for loving his family so much, right? And he doesn't love his uh, 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 his family the less for still loving Frodo as he does, right? There is no conflict in these things uh, in Sam's mind. Um, and I think if there's one thing that makes me most sad about the people who always want to talk about eroticism when they think about Frodo and Sam, it's this, that um, if you if you must construe Sam and Frodo's love for each other as an erotic relationship, like, then you see that, you know, like, people see that in conflict. Like, I, people joke about this all the time. Oh, I wonder what Rosie would say if she were there, right? Rosie was there. Like, they they all lived in the same house together for a while, and there's no... Eleanor doesn't disapprove. Rosie certainly doesn't disapprove, right? Um, there is no conflict. He has had lots of treasures. Um, he has not, far from being divided, far from being torn, he has been enriched. He has been able to have both, right? And he can wait. He can wait. He's going to be reunited with Frodo. But he's not impatient for that because he has his reward here now as well. Sam knows he's going to have it. Uh, he's going to have both, right? Um, in that sense, he is whole and he will always be whole, even though the sea longing is not going to leave him completely, right? Um, this is just such a remarkable passage. Um, and... I feel like, again, this is when people, it's, again, it's the thing that frustrates me. I feel so little desire to downplay the love between Frodo and Sam. Like, that is so not the point. Um, but uh, uh, Eleanor has such a, a sharp insight into the significance of that love uh, that, again, I am, um, I, 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 just want to like refer people to this passage. Um, Kimber's amazed that Eleanor wants to sail away with him. Well, here I think, um, Kimber, she's thinking about Arwen, right? Um, so again, think about the kind of relationship that she has to the story, the story that she's read three times. Um, she, uh, and I, I forget who earlier on was talking about, you know, children often relating to the like seeing themselves in the story, finding, um, uh, you know, themselves in the story. Um, uh, easy for Eleanor because her name is indeed in the story, right? The flower. Um, uh, and so she feels a close connection to Lothlorien. She would, uh, you know, it's not shocking to think that she found the parting of Arwen and Elrond a really poignant moment. Right, that that's a, a a bit that really jumped out at her, and when she is, um, when she's hearing about her dad now, whispering this secret to her that someday he is going to sail away too, like Elrond did, she immediately goes there. Right, one of the things I think that we can see here is just like Sam's vocabulary is all about the story, right? Um, so is, uh, so is 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 Eleanor's, right? She immediately uh, uh, links to that too. And of course, um, uh, yeah, yeah. And then Sam, of course, goes right back to Luthien. Um, maybe and maybe not. The choice of Luthien and Arwen comes to many or something like it, and it isn't wise to choose before the time. Um, you say that now. You might not feel that way and don't commit yourself. And of course, we know Eleanor is not going to sail away with him, right? Um, she is going to remain. And I think that Sam knows full well she's going to choose to remain. Um, and again, as we could see earlier in the passage, um, it's important that she does remain because the elven light needs to be passed on, right? Both narratively and genetically, right? The elvish light, the elven light needs to be passed on. Um, she is going to be like Arwen. But of course, you'll notice the parallel that Sam establishes here, Luthien to Arwen to Eleanor, 
works, right? Um, just as Arwen is the one who is going to bring the memory of the elder days into the dominion of men, right? As we talked about before, Eleanor is going to play that role among the hobbits, right? She's going to bring it genetically like Arwen did, and she's going to bring it uh, uh, narratively as well, bring a living memory. Uh, in this case, not um, her own, you know, memory of, uh, uh, of, you know, time with Elrond and Galadriel and everybody else that Arwen brings. Um, but in this case, the Red Book, right, is what she's going to bring with her. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Okay. Almost done. Those are the biggest passages, I think. Uh, the letter. But won't you show it to me first? I was going to stay. But won't you? Sorry, she had just said, but. Uh, yes, but. She'll, she, she'll go to bed. And he's like, no buts. And she says, but won't you show it to me first? I was going to say. Show you what, dear? The king's letter, of course. You have had it now more than a week. Sam sat up. Good gracious, he said, how stories do repeat themselves, and you get paid back in your own coin and all. How we spied on poor Mr. Frodo, and now our own spy on us, meaning no harm, no more harm than we did, I hope. But how do you know about it? There was no need for spying, said Eleanor. If you wanted it kept secret, you were not nearly careful enough, she says, almost exactly quoting them. Um... Uh, it came, at, uh, quoting Mary, isn't she? Uh, it came by the South Farthing Post early on Wednesday last week. I saw you take it, all, take it in, all wrapped in white silk and sealed with great black seals. Anyone who had heard the book would have guessed at once that it came from the king. Is it good news? Won't you show it me, Sam Dad? I love the, uh, the, the, uh, the way in which um, she... Again, we, we see her absorbing the story, repeating the story, and herself, and then Sam's observation how stories do repeat themselves, right? Um, uh, yeah, again, I love the metatextuality in this epilogue. This is so good. I'm so glad it exists, even though it didn't make the book. Uh, let me just move forward. Um, second and last passage. This is Tolkien summarizing this epilogue. Then he rides home. His wife welcomes him to the firelight and his first child, and he says simply, well, I've come back. There is a brief epilogue in which we see Sam among his children, a glance at his love for Eleanor, the elvish name of a flower in Lorien, his eldest, who by a strange gift has the looks and beauty of an elven maid. In, all, in her, all his love and longing for elves is resolved and satisfied. He is busy, contented, many times mayor of the Shire, and struggling to finish off the Red Book, begun by Bilbo and nearly completed by Frodo, in which all the events told in The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings are recorded. The whole ends with Sam and his wife standing outside Bag End as the children are asleep, looking at the stars in the cool spring sky. Sam tells his wife of his bliss and content and goes in, but as he closes the door, he hears the sighing of the sea on the shores of the world. So that last sentence that he went back and added, uh, uh, still clearly how he is imagining he wants uh, the book to end. And certainly, um, you know, the murmur, the sighing and murmuring of the sea on the shores of Middle-earth is a pretty good last line of The Lord of the Rings. No question. Um, but um, uh I loved this bit about in her all his love and longing for elves is resolved and satisfied, right? Eleanor is like both the embodiment of Sam's own love of elvish things, right? Um, it's almost like, you know, like he, you know, distilled all of his own elvishness into his first child. Um, and she not only shares all of his love and desire for elves, but herself uh, manifests all of that elvishness as well. Um, both resolved and satisfied. Um, it is the final expression, and again, he is content, right? That desire to see elves. Um, 
I remember Frodo was asking, right? Like, you wanted to see elves. You know, what do you think, right? And do you still want to go now that you've seen them, he says, in Woodall. But um, uh, his desire is satisfied. He has his treasure. He has his reward, right? And again, this is another thing that I think just really underscores that sentence to me. I have had my reward, right? I am a very rich hobbit. Um, very rarely does is a desire fulfilled in this kind of way, right? And we have the resolution that... Because, of course, that was another way in which Sam was torn in two, right? The desire to stay in the hot, in the Shire that he loves, but also the desire to leave it and go to the Elvish lands and see Elvish things. And now the Elvish lands have come here. Now in his daughter, Eleanor, he has both, right? He's whole. He has the Elvish lands, Right, he can like walk down, walk down to breakfast every day and say, "Elf, sir." Right, um, and yet it's home as well. It's almost like that, going to a place and it's still being like a distant place. Right, um, the Shire itself is no longer just a place to Sam. Right, in several different ways, several different dimensions. Oh man, all of this stuff. Um, uh, all of this stuff between, uh, like all the many different levels in which he's operating here. Um, you know, I understand, I think the rationale for cutting this out of the text. And I still f am not at all sad that Lord of the Lord of the Rings ends with, well, I'm back my favorite ending, but it's not like this stuff that gets cut out is just bad at all. This is really, really good stuff. Um, okay, last bit. Christopher talking about the cutting. He was persuaded by others to omit the epilogue from The Lord of the Rings. In a letter to Naomi Mitchison of 25 April 1954, uh, letters number 144, he wrote, Hobbit children were delightful, but I am afraid that the only glimpses of them in this book are found at the beginning of Volume 1. An epilogue giving a further glimpse, though of a rather exceptional family, has been so universally condemned that I shall not insert it. One must stop somewhere. He seems both to have accepted and to have regretted that decision. On 24 October 1955, a few days after the publication of The Return of the King, he wrote to Catherine uh, Ferrer, letters 173, I still feel the picture incomplete, without something on Samwise and Eleanor, but I could not devise anything that would not have destroyed the ending, more than the hints possibly sufficient in the appendices. Um, yeah, Mary, as far as, as far as who condemned it, I have to imagine that, like, all of the Inklings hated it. Um, I mean, he was still reading The Lord of the Rings to the Inklings. Um, yeah, I, I definitely... Uh, um, I definitely think that he, uh, they, they must have all hated it. I mean, the fact that he says it had been so universally condemned, he's probably exaggerating, but, um, but yeah, uh, you know, Hugo Dyson always hated the Lord of the Rings. Everybody apparently hated this. Um, so he doesn't insert it, but he still feels like the picture is incomplete without something on Samwise and Eleanor. It's them in particular. Right? It's this scene, that second scene, that second version of the scene where it's just a conversation uh, between Sam and Eleanor um, that he really... And, and, I, and I, you can see, right? I think the way that he ended the story with this really complex metatextual contemplation on what the role of story is and what the role and nature of his story is and um, the way that he can both tell us more about what happens in the future and give us a clearer sense of what the transition into the fourth age is and what that fourth age is going to be like. All those things we get from this conversation, but it's more than just a clearer glimpse of the future. It's also an application of the story itself and a return to the, to the, sto to the talking, to the discussion of stories from the stare of Kirith Ungol in a way that brings it back very directly uh, to this story itself. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm with you, Ronald. I, I think that was a really good ending. I, you know, it does, it is, 
it is less complete. There's no question. The story is less complete without our getting all of that. Um, but, well, I'm back. Totally an excellent ending. Um, uh, yeah, but... Um, yeah. Kate, I don't know. Um, Kate's asking, I wonder whether Christopher Tolkien had a voice. It must have. I mean, he was... He was sending Christopher chapters in, you know, in South Africa, right? Christopher Tolkien had to have had a vote in whether the epilogue was taken out. I think Christopher has to have been against it as well. Um, I think, I think Christopher has to have been one of those who condemned the epilogue. Um, it's hard to tell. Christopher plays it pretty close to the to the chest here as far as his own reactions in his commentary here um you know i'm kind of wondering if i can detect a little bit of like he doesn't really like this uh in his comments but i i i, I can't see anything clearly there i think he's just being distant and dispassionate in his editorial way um but um anyway so once again in conclusion Many thanks for Christopher Tolkien for letting us have it both ways, right? For allowing The Lord of the Rings to still end with, well, I'm back, um, but still enabling us to see this. So so there you go, Professor Tolkien. The picture is no longer incomplete because now we know this other thing that you wanted us to know um, without, you know, it uh, spoiling the effect of the ending anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thanks everybody for joining me. A little bit long today, but I did want to get through the epilogue because next time we are going to start the Notion Club papers. So join me next week for the first reading of the Notion Club papers. So just do the first reading. We'll, we'll go back to the schedule. Just bump it up a week. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and I will see you guys a week from now. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mary in the town. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. And I will see you guys. Uh, see you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.